You are not designed to be this perfect little thing. That's not what God wanted. If he wanted that, he would have stuck with the Pharisees. Does God love me? That's the big question, right? That's the one, like with all of the people out there who believe in God, there are 2.7 billion Christians in the world. And all the other, all of us who just believe in God, who love God, and yet there's so many Christians who ask every day, they ask themselves, does God love me? Or I'm not good enough. Could God really love someone like me? I know he says he does, but I've done so many bad things. I've messed up so many times. I've got this addiction and I've hurt this person and I've hurt this person. I've, I was rebellious my whole life. Can God really love me? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. I want to, I want to just I want to build confidence in you. I want to build, I want to encourage you and help you to see that God really does, in fact, love you. It isn't just some theory out there. It isn't just some idea that we have or some hope that, you know, some pastor told us God loves us. And so we just hope it's that way. I want to show you in scripture and prove to you that God loves you so that you can know for yourself. Not that I told you he loved you. Not that your pastor or your small group leader or your youth pastor told you that he loves you, but that you yourself know in your heart you have that deep core conviction of how much God loves you regardless of how much you've messed up regardless of all the stuff that's happened you have to get past that move past that and realize the love of God for you you know it's such a struggle the, the main reason that people struggle with this concept of the love of God where it's head knowledge but it hasn't gone into their hearts yet is because they haven't understood that fundamental difference between the Old and the New Testament. They're completely different sets of covenants. Testament is a covenant between God and his people. The Old Testament or the Old Covenant is where most Christians are stuck today. Most of us have that mentality, that Old Testament mentality, where we're looking at scriptures, we're looking at the Old Testament, we're seeing this God, you know, God who's got all of this wrath and judgment, and, you know, we're reading through it and like, oh my goodness, there are 613 laws that God has. It's impossible to fulfill these laws. So what ends up happening is, you know, the guy who's got like the dragon tattoo, like a blue dragon wrapped around his whole body, he's wearing a fedora, you know, he's, he's uh, reading Leviticus and he reads that chapter in Leviticus wherever, where God says, don't mark yourself with tattoos and don't cut your body and all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden he thinks, well, God hates me. I mean, it, uh, God hates tattoos. I've got my whole body covered in tattoos. So clearly God doesn't have a plan for me. And so he feels guilty, goes to the church. The church tells him he's evil. They don't welcome him in the church because he's got tattoos. And so all of a sudden that guy feels like he has nowhere to go. So then you've got the guy or the girl who has the porn addiction, addicted to pornography on the internet, and they're reading verses, don't commit adultery, don't commit fornication. And not only do they feel ashamed because they've got this addiction, but they feel all this other guilt and, and all this stuff, all these feelings going around, and they think that they're not so unworthy and they're so dirty and all this kind of stuff. So they don't go to church. They don't listen to people. They don't listen to Christians. As a matter of fact, a lot of them will have bitterness in their hearts because they feel so rejected by the church and they feel rejected by people. People. And so because they've got this sexual addiction of whatever kind it is, whether it's pornography or whatever other stuff we're not going to talk about, but whatever it is, they feel like they're stuck and they can't, they can't uh, get out. They can't talk to anybody. So they feel rejected by God and they feel rejected by the church. They feel like there's nobody they can talk to, nobody they can go to. And then you've got all the, you've got the, you know, the girl who just you know, woke up in a, the, the heroin addict who just woke up in a dumpster behind Red Lobster missing a shoe. And that girl, she's wanting a difference. She's wanting to have that new life, but because of the drug addiction and all this kind of stuff, she feels like, oh man, well, I can't, I'm just gonna have to take the walk of shame. You know, I just, this is just me. I'm gonna be addicted to this for the rest of my life. And so all these people, they, they have this they see this Old Testament God where God comes to them and says, you know, if you mix the wrong kind of perfume together, you're going to get stoned to death. You know, or, you know, the, some people, you know, uh, who was it? Aaron and Miriam, you know, they complain a little bit against Moses and Miriam gets leprosy all of a sudden. You know, and all this kind of crazy stuff that was poured out, that wrath of God that was poured out, you know, on them. Like the, 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 all the, uh, just all this different kinds of stuff. 
So there's this wrath that they see in the Old Testament and they are especially, you know, they see Adam and Eve, for example, all the movies and, you know, cartoons and all this stuff. They show Adam and Eve as like this innocent little naked couple, you know, Eve's got her hair all out in the front and, you know, they're just these innocent childlike, you know, man and woman, man boy and woman, you know, they're, they're so innocent. They're like these little puppies and they don't know anything that's going on. And, you know, they're, they're just sort of there in the garden. And then Satan comes, this evil, bad, you know, Satan comes along and offers them an apple or whatever fruit it was. And Eve just so innocently takes the apple and just as little girl, I mean, they show her as a woman, but she has like the mind of a little girl. Like, oh, she's so innocent. She eats the fruit, gives it to Adam. And, you know, Adam's just like, oh, you know, like you, like super book kind of stuff or veggie tales where they're just like these super innocent people. But you, and so what happens is they, they see that they ate the fruit and then God comes down and God is just full of wrath and he's like, get out of the garden of Eden. And he just throws them out of the garden just mercilessly. You know, you ate one apple, you ate one apple when I told you not to. So now you're out of the garden forever and you're cursed and all this bad stuff's going to happen to you. And that's the mentality that people have that God is just full of wrath and hate towards people. And so because of that Old Testament covenant. So I wanna start with that really quickly. I wanna, I wanna bring understanding to this because first of all, you have to realize Adam and Eve were not these innocent little children that are always shown in media. That is not how it went down. Okay, God created Adam and Eve in his own image, right? The Adam and Eve, now listen to me here for a minute. Adam and Eve, were closer to God, had a greater understanding of his ways, of his creation, of his personality, and had the greatest access to him more than any other person in history, including Jesus in human form. Now, before you start throwing stones at me, virtual stones, think about this for a minute. When Jesus was on earth, he came in the form of a fallen man. Now he committed no sin, he was perfect, but he still came in human flesh, which means, and this was in the old covenant, so that meant that that separation of God and man because of sin was still there. Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus grew in favor with man and God, that he grew in it. So Jesus was not born into this ultra relationship with God that we see him with later on in life. He was born in a fallen body in a cursed world world. He had to learn prayer. He had to learn to walk with God just like the rest of us. He had to deal with sickness. He had to deal with temptation. He dealt with all the other stuff, people hating him, people cursing him, people persecuting him, all that kind of stuff. Adam and Eve didn't have to deal with any of that. You know, Jesus did not walk face to face physically with God in a perfect in perfect environment where there was no temptation and nothing around to disturb him. You know how awesome that would be? You know how many of us we lock ourselves in a closet just to try and get a little bit of silence. You know, for me, I've got my two boys. Anytime I try and go anywhere that they can't see me, they're knocking on the door. Where are you? Where are you? So Adam and Eve, they had that. Jesus was walking in a cursed, fallen world. So even he, in the he, Jesus was more like us, right? He was like us, where he was tempted to face. Adam and Eve were nothing like us. Adam and Eve, when they were first created, they were the they were ultra humans. They were immortal. They helped God in his creation. God created everything, but God allowed Adam and Eve, or Adam, I should say, to name the animals. They walked with God in the garden every single day. They knew his nature. They knew who he was. He knew, they knew how he worked. They had greater access to him than anybody else in history since them. And then Satan comes along and them knowing full well the, the nature of God, knowing full well who God was, they chose Satan over God. They willingly rebelled. It wasn't these little doe eyes, like innocent doe eyes of, oh, an apple, what could happen? No, they knew full on because they were with God in the process of that creation of naming the, the, the animals. They were with God. They were with him daily walking in the garden of the cool day. He was sharing with them. They knew it wasn't this innocent thing. And they full on said, you know what? We choose this evil lying snake over God and we are gonna disobey God even though we talked to him face to face and they knew God would come for them to come and talk to them to see what would happen just like he did that cool that afternoon. They were hiding and God said, where are you? And that whole thing happened where they ended up getting cursed and this is the thing that we have to come to right now. What we need to realize is that whenever Adam and Eve broke the covenant with God, God had made this, 
God was with them, right? And he was with them in the garden. They had a relationship. God created Adam and Eve, their sole purpose, like what God created them for. God didn't need them in the sense that he needs humans or, you know, he was just like, oh man, what am I going to do? Let's create some people. That's not how it worked. God longs for relationship, just like every single human, just like you do, just like I do. Every single one of us, the core of every single human being is relationship. We need relationship with somebody, love from somebody. That's why the wealthiest people in the world, they can have billions of dollars, but they'll still commit suicide if they feel like everybody hates them, okay? It doesn't matter how, if, if people who feel loved, that is an inborn thing where you, that is where fulfillment comes from. They've done all these studies and shown people will take a lower paying job to, to do something that they enjoy where they feel like they're being fulfilled than they will pay, taking a higher paying job and they feel empty inside, okay? Now, I know there are exceptions, but let's just not argue about that. Um, because in the end, it's all about fulfillment, okay? So, now, people have an innate need for fulfillment. God put that in us on purpose, that need for love, because that is what God himself wants. God wants that deep, profound relationship with somebody. So he created Adam and Eve in this perfect environment. He gave them everything just because he wanted to be friends with them. That's what the end result was. God wanted a friend. He wanted somebody to love it. You know, a lot of times we say in church, you know, we were created to worship him. That is true. We were created, but whenever, when we say that, there tends to be that connotation of, you know, we're just falling down, bowing on our knees, saying, oh God, you're so wonderful all the time, which is true. He is awesome and wonderful. We do worship him. But that wasn't really the core reason for God creating us. It wasn't really that we were created to worship him. It was we, we were created to be in a relationship with him. God, if you look through Old New Testament, there's one core thing you'll see through all of it. God loves his friends. He wants friends. Whenever Jesus Jesus told the parable of how at the end of time, whenever it's judgment day, people are going to come up and they're going to say, didn't we cast out demons in your name and prophesy in your name and do all these miracles in your name? What does Jesus say to the ones that he rejects? He says, be gone from me. I never knew you. It doesn't matter. All that works, all that other stuff doesn't matter. What matters is whether God, what God cares about is not all the stuff you do. That does not matter to God. What matters to God is your relationship with him, that you are a friend of his, because out of that friendship, this stuff happens. I mean, I, I, I travel all over. I preach all the time, constantly going around doing stuff for the Lord. But that is just a byproduct of my friendship with him. If I didn't do any of that, if something happened and, you know, I broke my legs and I couldn't go anywhere and do anything, God would still love me just as much because that friendship would still be there. Okay, so this is the thing that we have to understand. Adam and Eve, they chose to break their friendship with God. They said, you know what? And imagine how you feel. Now, whenever someone breaks that relationship with you, whenever someone says, you know what? I don't even want to be your friend anymore. It's a horrible feeling. So God, in all of his love, he created Adam and Eve. They reject their friendship with him. They say, we don't want you, God. We're going with the snake over here. We're going to eat some apples. All right. Now, God in media, he's often, often shown as angry and like kicking them out of heaven or kicking them out of Eden, I mean. But that's not the case. What happened, it was not that God was punishing them in that sense. God was not angry at them. You could read through the whole, read through those chapters of Genesis. Look at it yourself. You will find God is not angry. God does not show any anger in that whole thing. What he does show is heartbrokenness. God was not angry at Adam and Eve. He was heartbroken for several reasons. One, because they rejected his friendship, and that hurts anybody. It hurts your heart whenever somebody rejects you. Especially, you know, God, he wants a bride. And, you know, this per you know, these people that he had created that he wanted this love relationship with, they rejected him, okay? So on top of that, though, God is life. Okay, God created life, God is life, in him is all life. Outside of him, there is no life, there is no true love. There's, there's lust and there's other things, but there's no true, true, real, legit love. So he knew, he was heartbroken because of that relational break, but also because God knew the consequences of what was about to happen. It wasn't that Adam and Eve, it wasn't that God said, all right guys, hey, you know what, you don't want me? Well, you can all just die then. That's not, that's not the point. That's not what happened. God was telling them the consequences of what they did. All right. If you're a soldier and you're, you know, fighting a war in a heavy war zone and your commander tells you, hey, don't go down that hill because you're going to get killed. And you say, 
you know what? I don't care. I'm going anywhere. I like it down there better. You go down, you get killed. You can't blame the commander. The commander may get mad, but he told you what was going to happen. He, You had a relationship. You understood the chain of command. You went anyway. It was the same with Adam and Eve. They knew God. They had walked in the garden. They knew what was outside. They knew that all life was in him and they chose death. Okay, God said, I put before, this is later on in the Old Testament, he said, I put before you life and death. Choose life. It's a choice that you have to choose. Adam and Eve chose death. And now all of us are living in this fallen world because of their choice of death. All right. So God was not angry at them. He was heartbroken. They were forced out of his presence because death will not dwell in the presence of God. That's why if you don't believe in Jesus, you don't get to go to heaven. It's not because God doesn't want you in heaven or that God hates you. It's because, simply because death cannot dwell in the presence of God. It can't be there no matter how much he loves you. God loves you so much. He did send Jesus to die for you. He did this whole thing for you. And yet so many people choose death, but it's not God putting them in death. They're choosing it and they don't get to go to heaven, not because he doesn't want them there. God would do anything he could to make heaven available for everyone, but death simply can't dwell in the presence of God. So God will do anything to bring people into his presence, into heaven. So what happened, Adam and Eve, they break faith with God. And then God, seeing this, realizing there's been this division between himself and his people, the people that he loved, that he created to be friends with, that rejected him. People start to get born, the population of the world multiplies, things get worse and worse, and God is seeing these people that he loves so much, but they're separated from him. So what God does is he creates this temporary covenant, the old covenant, the old law, right? He creates all these. This is the stuff that most people think that we're still living in today, is this God of law, right? God creates these laws, all right, 613 laws in the Old Testament. It's all kinds of stuff that he did. And when we read it, we're like, oh my goodness, God is, he demands such perfection and such a high, just such, such a high level of, of all this, you know, don't, don't, uh, what is it? Sew a shirt together from two different thread, kinds of thread. And don't boil a goat and its mother's milk. And, you know, don't, don't, you know, all the th everything has to be perfect. The temple has to be perfect. All that you have to pray in the temple. And we read that and we're like, this is impossible. And if you break any of those laws, the wrath of God comes down and you get the earth opens up like in the, the rebellion of Korah, you know, the ground opens up and eats them all and all this kind of stuff happens. But see, you have to understand the world was so broken. People were evil. People were bad. I mean, there was most of the world was worshiping all these uh, idols. They were sacrificing their children, making all these horrible things, doing all this horrible stuff. And God was like, there's still some out there who love me. There's still some out there who want me. So what God did temporarily was he made the old covenant with Moses, that covenant of 613 laws, the 10 commandments, all that jazz. And he says, all right, I'm trying to make a window for you. I'm trying to make a door for you while I work in the background to create the ultimate covenant between man and, uh, man and God, this ultimate door opening. So for all those thousands of years, Pete, man was living under the old covenant. We don't, we're not gonna go into that whole thing. But you have to understand that, that that picture of God from the Old Testament, that was God in his mercy creating a window for human beings, for the few who, human beings that there were. Think about Noah, okay? Noah and his sons were the only people on the planet who believed God. The Bible says that Noah was like the only righteous man in his generation. And so the whole world got wiped out by the flood. All right, think about, read through the Bible, look at old cultures, and you will see just the depravity of man back then, okay? So God is working in the background for all this time. He's sending prophets. He's sending his people. He's sending his presence. He's sending miracles. All this of God trying through all this depravity of man because of the separation of life, because of the separation between man and God, men are so evil and God is drawing a few people to him. Not because he's not calling everybody, but because only a few people were responding to him. So then years later, finally, we get to whenever Jesus is going to come and God has prepared the way all this time and he's got you in his mind. He's got me in his mind the whole time thinking, I got to get them into heaven. I got to get them. I want his whole longing, his whole purpose the whole entire time was for there to be a relationship between he and you. That is what he wants above all is to have a relationship with you. He That same thing with Adam and Eve. The whole time he was thinking what I had with Adam and Eve before 
that fall, that perfect relationship, that walking with them, them being enveloped in my presence. That's what I want. I want that back. I want that back. How do I get it back? And he had this whole master plan that he was putting together. He knew how he was going to get it back, but it was all a matter of just working with humans because God is sovereign and he's all powerful, but he works with human beings. The Bible says he gave us dominion over the world. And so since he gave us dominion, he gives us the freedom. Okay, it's like whenever your children grow up, if you have adult children, you, you don't baby them forever. You, they live their own life and you have to step back and let them make their decisions and their mistakes. And, that's, and God does the same thing. You know, he lets us make mistakes and we think, well, if he knew, why didn't he tell me? He does tell us in his word, but most of us, most people don't really study his word and see what he says. When you walk in his presence, walk in his word, you know, and I'm not saying, I mean, there is a devil, there is a war going on, bad stuff happens. Uh, but that's a whole that's a whole other video. So before Jesus came, you would have spent your whole life doing all of these rituals, all I mean, all this like don't trim your beard and all this crazy stuff that even God knew humans could not fulfill. And that was the thing, that was the whole purpose of the law, was to show human beings how we are not able to be perfect. That's the whole point. So you feeling like you're not capable, that's the whole point of the law. God knew that from the, he's known that forever, that you're not capable of doing it. That's why you have to stop get, stop being stuck in that. Of, well, I can't do it because I'm never gonna be perfect. I'm never gonna get over this addiction. That is not a good reason to not follow Jesus because God already knows that about that you. He already knows your failures. He already knows your issues. That is why he sent Jesus, because he knew you couldn't do it. He knew you weren't ever going to be perfect. He knew you were going to struggle. He knew you were a human being, and he still loves you. No matter how human you are, he loves you. So he sent Jesus, and God said, all right, I'm going to make the ultimate path. I'm going to make the ultimate way for people to know how much I love them. So he sends Jesus. Jesus come down, comes down, and like I said, you would have had to do all these crazy rituals. Even today, even in these modern times, you would still be doing these crazy rituals and everything. But God sends Jesus. Jesus comes down, fulfills the whole law. All those 613 laws that we're like, oh my, I'll never be able to do it. Jesus fulfilled them. And he made that sacrifice because the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So back then they were sacrificing animals and goats and all kinds of stuff. And we would have had to do that too because blood covers sin. Because when you do something wrong, there has to be a consequence. Adam and Eve did something wrong. The consequence was separation from God. After that, when you're in a cursed world, you're already separated from God. So the only punishment then is death. So once you're separated from God, that's it. Death is the next step. So that's why back then and still today, you know, the consequences of sin is death and hell and all that, all that bad stuff. Okay. So Jesus came and he said, you know what? I'm going to make it as easy as possible. So he comes down, dies on the cross, pays all that. Okay. Your, the consequence that you're supposed to have is separation from God and then death. Jesus comes. He says, I will take that consequence from them. And so that way, what they had in the garden, what humans had in the garden, they could have it back. You, because of Jesus, because he took all the punishment that you should have for your problems, Jesus said, I'll take that. He suffered the, the, the consequences that you should have suffered, and he created a door. for the, the Bible says that Jesus is the door. He created this doorway for you now to go back to that same covenant with, that God had with Adam and Eve, that same lifestyle of walking in his presence. You can have it. Okay, but you have to get past that mentality of God, may, maybe God doesn't love me. You have to realize Jesus loved you so much. He took all that punishment from you. Okay, what you should have had. But on top of that, think about this. This is where a lot of people don't understand the covenants. Okay, they get that Jesus died for them. They get that Jesus died on the cross and took their sins and all that kind of stuff. But what they don't realize is those 613 laws all the way up until the last book of the Old Testament don't apply to you anymore. Okay. Jesus came and he said, I give you a new law. All right, what was the new law that God gave? Paul calls it the law of love. You know what that law is? We only have two. We don't have 613 laws anymore. We have two. Love the Lord your God with all your strength, soul, mind, emotions, all that kind of stuff, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. And you know what's amazing? And this is, again, what people don't think about is the old law was so specific. You had to pray a certain way. You had to dress a certain way. You had to do your hair a certain way, all this kind of stuff. In the New Testament, all of that is gone. In the New Testament, 
God gives the most, these, Jesus gives these incredibly vague laws. And he did that on purpose because the Bible says that God would write the law on our hearts. The reason why Jesus did that is because each one of us individually have an individual relationship with God, which is what he always wanted. People say, if God is so all powerful, God is so awesome, why doesn't he just save everyone? Why doesn't he just make everyone love him? That would defeat the whole purpose of humankind, guys. The whole purpose was for us to have a relationship with him, all right? You know what it's called when you take somebody and you force them to love you? It's called one of two things. It's either rape or it's slavery. And God does not do either of those because he is perfect and holy and awesome. What God wants is a full-on re love relationship, a legit love relationship with us. You don't get that by creating robots. That's why it is a full-on choice. You can choose whether you want God or not. You can watch this video and say, you know what? I don't believe any of that stuff. I don't believe in God. And that's completely fine. That's your choice. God gave us all a choice and that's okay. He's not going to force anybody into a relationship with him. That's a choice that we make. So Jesus gives us these two really vague laws so that as individuals, we can express our love to him in different ways. Some people dance, some people sing, some people like myself, I usually am pretty quiet. I quietly sit there and worship God. You know, a lot of, some people will just sit there silently. Other people, you know, they're wild and they're yelling and crying. You know, my, in Latin America, where I spend most of my time, people are usually on the floor bawling and all, you know, crying and wailing. That's their way of expressing. God did that to make it as open as possible, absolutely as free as possible for everyone. Read Paul, read the Bible. In the New Testament, Paul talks about the importance of freedom based on your conscience. The law is in your conscience, okay? And that is exactly why we don't go around doing all kinds of bad stuff because it's in your conscience. All right, you have to pay attention to that. You have to pay attention when you feel guilty about something. When you start to, well, it's not really guilt, it's conviction of the Holy Spirit. When you feel that conviction, that is the thing that God is telling you to stay away from. It isn't about the law. You do need to read your Bible. It's good to read the Old Testament. It's even better to read the New Testament. Because when you're reading the New Testament, you're going to see it's all about love. It's all about passion for God. It isn't about, oh man, I'm going to try not to fall into this sin this time. Or, oh man, I'm going to try not to smoke that. I'm going to try not to do that. It's not about trying not to do it. It is about walking with God. It is about being a friend of God. I guarantee you, change your mindset. Stop focusing on, stop being in defensive mode. Of, all right, I've got to fend this stuff off. Stop doing that. What you need to do is to focus on your relationship with God. Spend real time with Him. I'm not talking about spend 10 minutes reading your Bible and just reading a few verses and saying some, just ran, just a prayer, you know, the prayer that you quote every day before you go to bed or whatever it is. I mean, really sit down. Imagine that you're walking with God down the street. You're on a walk or whatever it is you do. Talk to Him. Say, God, this is what I'm struggling with. I want to feel your presence. I want to walk in your presence like Adam and Eve did. You do that, I assure you, you will start to feel his presence and you will start to live in his presence and that other stuff, that sinful stuff, the bad stuff will start to wash away and God will just purge it from your life and most of the time you don't even notice that it's happening because you're so filled with his presence. It stops being this, you're defending yourself against the enemy to now you're coming out of his, you're living in his presence, living out of it right? Everything you do comes out of your, your relationship and your presence and in the presence of God. And all of a sudden you stop being defensive and you start being a dominating force in the kingdom of God and on this planet because we were called to dominion. We were called to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse the leper. That kind of stuff is offensive. If you haven't seen my video, Spiritual Revolution and the violence of uh, what spiritual violence is, you need to see that because I talk about how we're supposed to live offensively. We're supposed to be dominating Christians. We're not supposed to be defensive. The gates of hell will not prevail against us. That is not the gates of hell attacking us. Gates are defensive. We attack the gates. We kick down those gates and we take back from the enemy. That is what we're called to. So. Does God love you? He loves you enough that he spent all these years, thousands of years, working out a way to make the absolute most open, absolutely possibly open relationship between you and him that he could. He removed 613 laws, boiled it down to two, sent his son, took the punishment that you should have had on himself, fulfilled those laws, and even adapted his relationship with you, not based on laws and rituals, but based on 
personal between you and him. He loves your personality. He loves who you are. He loves how human you are and how unique you are. He loves it if you're weird. He loves it if you're normal. He loves it if you're nerdy. He loves it if you're whatever other thing there is besides nerdy. He loves all of that about you. You have to accept that. Stop believing the lie that you can't because you're not good enough, because you struggle with this or because you have this. or Stop worrying about that stuff. Jesus loves you and he wants to talk to you and be in a relationship with you and walk with you in the garden, walk with you in your house. That's what you were designed for. You are not designed to be this perfect little thing. That's not what God wanted. If he wanted that, he would have stuck with the Pharisees. He doesn't want that. God wants real organic relationships with people. He wants you to get to know him and to get to know you. He knows everything about you, but there's that relational difference. It's like I can I can read about a movie star and know everything about them, but it's a completely different thing to have a relationship with them. So know that God loves you. He wants to be with you. Be blessed. Please, if you know somebody who might need this, share this with them. Because our whole thing is we want to change lives. We want to, we want to take from the enemy. We want to re- remove the lies, remove the veils. Please share this. Please help get this message out there. Because people know, so many people don't realize how much God loves them. And God loves you. And he wants to walk with you. Be blessed. Have a great day or evening or whatever it is. Stay tuned. There's way more adventure coming. Thank <laughs> you.